Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And we're going to spend this program talking about something that I never heard of before. It's all captured in an intriguing, fascinating novel. And when I give you the title of the book, you know that we're going somewhere unknown. The title of this novel is The Language of Flowers. Now, they don't talk to us like tongues, but they do talk to us. The author who uh, claims this and writes about it is Vanessa Diffenbaugh, and her book is published by Ballantine Books. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for having me. The, uh, th- this is a novel that has been described as the publishing highlight of 2011. That, I suppose, you paid for, or it's your father <laughs> or, or, or your mother. Uh, and you, you might, from that, suspect that this could be a very different kind of story. And it is, because it, it's about foster children and foster care and the language of flowers. That's quite an omelet. How did you get to it? It's quite a combination. I agree. I really set out to tell the story of this young woman, Victoria, who was emancipating from the foster care system. And the the character that I wanted to write about was really so detached um, from the world around her. She'd been through a lot of trauma. She'd never connected with a family. And when she was 10 years old, this um, woman tried to adopt her. And she taught her the Victorian language of flowers. And when I sat down to write the book, the two just came together without much planning. I had this very tough character, and she needed some way to communicate. So the very first scene that I wrote, she was in the the flower market, and a young man looks at her in a way that made her very uncomfortable. And instead of responding with words like most well-adjusted young people might do, (laughs) she leaves and comes back a week later with a sprig of rhododendron, which means beware. So that's actually the very first scene I wrote, and the whole thing took off from there. Now, um, the the, the connection to to flowers is because the woman who's trying to make her – her own is into flowers. Is that your sense of it? Or, I mean, it's all quite natural in the book, and and, and I don't mean to make a logic problem out of this. (laughs) Sure. But uh, they're listening out there, and they're saying foster care and flowers. Right. How did she do this? Right. So I think um, to try to make it very simple, um, I had a character that was very, very, very tough. Okay. And I needed some way. I wanted to stay true to that character and to this experience. Okay. But it was also first person. And so how do you write a book where you're asking a reader to spend 300 pages inside the mind of someone who's very, very, very tough? Mm -hmm. And I needed to give her some way to connect. And she couldn't connect with other human beings. It was outside her capability early in the book. But she connected with flowers. Not only is she tough, she's also not entirely admirable Mm -hmm. in terms of some of the things that she does. And um, you make a very strong case that many of her bad choices are due to the whole foster care apparatus. And uh, you've had firsthand acquaintanceship with it. I have. I've been a foster parent for about five years. And I think that for me, it wasn't, I really wasn't trying to write a book that was making excuses for kids and their behavior, right? (laughs) Um, I was trying to um, just give readers a chance to be inside the mind of someone who makes decisions in a very different way. Okay. Um, Because I think for me, I was very loved as a child, and everything I've ever done has been had something to do with love, right? I'm looking for love. I'm trying okay. to keep it. I'm trying to express it. It's been my guiding star in every way that I live. And some of the young people that I've worked with that have had a lot of trauma and not very much attachment make decisions in a completely different way. And so I was trying to um, kind of give a window into that experience, I think. And let's talk a little bit about what's called the Victorian 
language of flowers. Now, it's called Victorian because when it first started? It was in the Victorian era. Mm-hmm. And who was one of the first practitioners that we should know about? Well, there's quite a history. Um, but to give you the very, very short version, there was a woman named Lady Mary Montague, whose mm-hmm. husband was a um, diplomat and traveled to Turkey. And he, um, she, when she was there, saw the practice of the Salam, where people would exchange gifts through handkerchiefs, and they would have to translate the objects inside the handkerchiefs into a sentence. (laughs) And so she wrote letters about this practice and was very taken with it. And the Victorians, who were flower-obsessed, kind of transferred the symbolic meanings of objects to the symbolic meanings of flowers. And someone named Charlotte um, de Latour wrote the first flower dictionary and assigned a lot of the symbols based on Greek mythology and history and plant science, botany, that kind of thing. And then, I mean, now we have dictionaries of flower language. Yes. So Uh, in the 1800s, um, there were hundreds and hundreds of these dictionaries in circulation all across Europe and the United States. Well, lest you think this is going to continue to be an erudite discussion about foster care and the language of flowers, let me assure you that like every work of fiction, uh, novels are about This novel is about people, and we're going to meet some of them when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com. We're talking today to Vanessa Diffenbach who has written a book called The Language of Flowers, which is published by Ballantine Books. And an old friend of ours, uh, uh, Jamie Ford, the author of On the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, uh, has had some wonderful things to say about this book. And I uh, learned off air that this is the first person that uh, Vanessa sent the book to. And he replied, in part, a deftly powerful story of finding your way home, even after you've burned every bridge behind you, almost literally in the case of this story. <laughs> the language of flowers took my heart apart, chapter by chapter, then reassembled the broken pieces in better working condition. I love this book. Jamie? That's very nice. Couldn't ask for more very, than very that. Very, very nice. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, one, of, one of the things, one of the characters in here that, um, you know, people could, if I think, give the book a superficial reading, say that uh, she's a baddie. I'm talking about uh, Meredith Cone. And she's the caseworker who follows our friend, uh, throughout the whole book. And she's always in on, on, on the heavy side of the equation, isn't she? She was a hard character for me to write because I am a foster parent and I'm very protective of foster parents. And in the same way, I'm protective of social workers. And social workers have a bad rap, like foster parents do often. Um, and so I didn't want to further that stereotype by making this kind of tough, mean... Um, character that didn't have a lot of warmth or compassion. Uh, But at the same time, you know, I I have been in the system a long time. And I think what you tend to see with social workers who've been with kids a long time, how Meredith has is, I think she started out really hopeful and really trying to do what was best for Victoria. And over time, um, she just got worn down. Social workers in our system tend to have 60 or more kids on their caseload. So they've really been set up to fail, and it's hard not to become bitter after They've that. been set up to fail. They've been set up to do things in an impersonal, yeah. uh, good-for-the-system oh, way. Oh, absolutely. When we I were, mean, that's, yeah. you know, quote, their, their job. And yeah. in my daughter's case, when she was in the process of adopting, I was invited down to San Diego for the last day when the Oh, that's Judge wonderful. Drop the gavel, you know, which you mm-hmm. talk about in this book. And one of the invitees who came 
was the main social worker on oh, the wow. case. So there are there yeah. are there are other stories. Oh, there's there, absolutely there are other stories. Yes. One of the most sympathetic characters, I think, and I think a clever person, is Renata, mm -hmm. the, the woman who uh, owns uh, a flower shop uh, here in San Francisco. We must mention that much mm -hmm. of the book story takes place right here mm -hmm. in San Francisco. Do you like Renata as much as I do? I do. <laughs> I think I really do. And I think that she's... You know, and Victoria realizes this early on. She's as perfect for her as she could have ever hoped for. Yeah. In terms yeah. of she doesn't ask for much back, you know, but she's very straight with her and she's very upfront about this is what I need and this is what I'm willing to give you. And there what there's not a lot of guessing or gray area in that relationship. Yeah, and that kind of I, I think pulls her into maybe for the first time an understanding of what an adult relationship is supposed to be. Right. You don't, you know, stamp your feet and kick right. over everything. Right. You know, you, <laughs> exactly. You you come to work when right. you're told to come to work. Right. And and you're rewarded for that. Right. So she's a great character. And then uh, there's there's Grant, mm -hmm. uh, whom I've identified as you did. I love this phrase: the mysterious vendor. <laughs> <laughs> He's at the flower mart, which right. is right around right from around where the we're corner from now. where we are. Yeah. I love the San Francisco flower mart. Tell us about tell us about the mysterious vendor. Well, he is very handsome, of course, and very very patient, and very loving and very consistent. And so, when people ask me where I modeled him, I just said, "Well, my husband, of course." <laughs> Now, that's a very politically Isn't correct Isn't that answer. great? <laughs> very politically correct. But he's a, um, another person that's good for Victoria in that he, um, well, he speaks her language very literally, right? He's the yes. only person who yes. she's ever met that actually understands the language of flowers and understands not only what the flowers mean, but that she's trying to communicate at all. I think that, that what's interesting about Victoria is she's using this language where Nobody knows what she's saying or that she's saying anything at all. Mm -hmm. And so she's not opening herself up to be vulnerable or to even have a conversation. And so with Grant, she ends up um, being forced to confront the fact that he understands what she's saying and has his own response. And so it's really the beginning of, of a relationship. Then there is one of the main persons in the book, Elizabeth Anderson, mm -hmm. the foster parent who is a combination of worst and best yes. foster parent. The scene at the beginning, when we first meet her, about how she serves Victoria frozen peas. Oh, that's a different foster parent, actually. Oh, it is? It I'm is. sorry. I'm sorry. That's a flashback. Oh, oh, oh. Into her sort of the trauma apologize. of her past. No problem. No, I mean, I have to apologize to Elizabeth. <laughs> yes, you should apologize terrible, to Elizabeth. She would never do that. Terrible <laughs> thing to say about, about Elizabeth. Elizabeth, though, to put it simply, mm -hmm. loves Victoria. She does. And she puts up with God knows what because of that. Yes. Victoria has a, a, a horrible habit of sliding back down to the lowest level of response and utterance. Mm-hmm. And all like that. Is that because she's a foster child? or? Well, I think all foster children are different, right? Just like all children are different. And our son that has been with us eight, uh, five years is uh -huh. really, really reaches out and latches on and connects. Um, but a lot of kids um, that are, have been in the foster care system have just been rejected over and over and over and over again. And so I think it's very common for kids in the system not to feel worthy of that love and so do things to sabotage it. Don't you think Victoria sounds interesting? Well, if you do, stay tuned. We're going to talk some more about her when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster, COC at gmail.com. The Language of Flowers by Vanessa Diffenbach. That's the book we're talking about today. And um, 
what I'd like to do to start this segment, Vanessa, if you don't mind, is ask you to read a, a brief uh, passage from the book for two reasons. One, because I like the writing very, very much. And secondly, because I, I think without saying it in any kind of analytical way, it tells us a lot about the two characters involved at the head of the story. So could sure. you do that for us, please? Absolutely. And you'd Thanks. like me to read where Grant's looking for Victoria, right? <laughs> okay. okay. But he didn't pause at the heath. He turned back to the verbena and bowed his head. I was too far away to see the delicate clustered petals in which he dipped his nose, too far away to hear his hushed words, but I knew he was praying. My forehead pressed against the glass, and I felt my body being pulled toward him by the strength of my own desire. I missed his sweet, earthy smell, his cooking, and his touch, the way he placed his square palms over each side of my face as he looked into my eyes, and the way his hands smelled of soil, even, if the, even after they had just been washed. But I could not go to him. He would make promises, and I would repeat his words because I wanted to believe in his vision of our life together. But over time we would both find my words meaningless. I would fail. It was the only possible outcome. Closing my eyes, I forced my body away from the window. My shoulders fell forward, belly pressed against parted thighs. The, the sun warmed my back. If I had known how, I would have joined Grant in, par in prayer. I would have prayed for him, for his goodness, his loyalty, and his improbable love. I would have prayed for him to give up, to let go, and to start over. I might have even prayed for forgiveness. But I didn't know how to pray. Instead, I stayed as I was, folded over on the floor of a stranger's living room, waiting for Grant to give up, forget about me, and go home. You know, I I think the, the, the phrase, but I didn't know how to pray, mm -hmm. is one of the saddest phrases that one can imagine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and... She doesn't it, have a lot of faith no, in others or in herself in or herself in anything. In herself or anything. Mm -hmm. I mean... That is our, that's our friend, Victoria Jones, who is part of the foster care, foster parent system. And on the one hand, she's a victim. Uh, many instances of that. And not only is she a, a, a victim on specific instances, but being a victim makes her the kind of person she is or the kind of person she can't become. Right. That's the saddest part, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. There's also something about uh, her, it seems to me, being able to play the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I've, and I've seen that in, in, in my daughter's mm -hmm. uh, the they know the rules early on oh. <laughs> about how people oh. are supposed to treat them. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the big issues in their household right now is my daughter trying to give, convince the boy that this isn't the way it was. This is the way it is, namely mm -hmm. that we're not your foster parents anymore. Right. We've adopted you. Right. We're your mommy and daddy. Right. You know? And you can't. Right. <laughs> and because, I mean, he was 11 years old when they right. adopted That's him. That's amazing. Yeah. It's wonderful, wonderful. And it's so important. The you know, he's did. had all this experience right. playing the game. Right. And he doesn't right. really want to stop in some right. way. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. And he's going to continue to test her. And and what's, of course, interesting is anyone who's been a biological parent as well, your kids will always con always test you yeah. <laughs> and always try to find out the limits. But I think it is different when kids come from different families. They have... Um, a whole range of expectations that yeah. they can test because they've seen it in action. And yet one of the deepest yearnings that that these kids have is well expressed by Victoria. I don't know which occasion this was, mm -hmm. but it opens with the, the, the sentence that she would use many, many times. I didn't want to go back. I liked Elizabeth. I liked her flowers, her grapes, and her concentrated attention. Finally, I realized I had found the place I wanted to stay. What a great time. What a great moment. And then, of course, she 
tests her over and over again, yeah. even after yeah. that moment. You even know? after that moment, <laughs> yeah. she's still playing, playing right. the game. Right. Uh, I, I don't know. Now, one of the things uh, that Victoria develops uh, is her skill mm-hmm. with arranging flowers, uh, and and she works in uh, her her friend's place, and then develops a business of of, of her own, right? Which uh, seems to be as much matchmaker as, <laughs> as it is flowered. But she says, "I knew I could not give Anne Maria Gerber daisies." I had been loyal to nothing except the language of flowers, and if I started lying about it, there would be nothing left in my life. That was beautiful or true. There she is, really getting mature, getting to a a point where one could recognize her, not as a a foster child, but as a beautiful, talented woman. Yeah. Well, that's the trip you'll make in this wonderful book called The Language of Flowers by Vanessa Diffenbach. You might want to run out right now and buy it. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Thank you so much. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.